and welcome to this first session of Getting Started with Polyanalyst. Polyanalyst is an all-in-one tool. It can handle everything from data loading, to data cleansing and manipulation, to structured and unstructured data analysis, up to the final reporting of our results. And all of that using an intuitive and user-friendly graphical interface. Now we mentioned structured and unstructured data in the previous slide. Structured data refers to data that's organized and formatted based on a predefined schema so that it's easily understandable and searchable by a computer. This is usually what we see in the tables in Excel, for example. Structured data usually contains numerical values or categorical values. And some examples of structured data include things like rating scales, brand names, and dates. Unstructured data, on the other hand, does not follow a predefined schema or data model. We generally mean free text or natural language when we use this term. Now, text does have internal organization that we as humans can understand and analyze, and this is because we have the relevant linguistic knowledge. But that's not the case for computers. Unless we supply the linguistic information, natural language isn't easily understandable by computers. Consider the following examples. The claimant did not break in time and rear-ended the insured, and the blue Toyota was hit on the rear when the Volvo failed to break in time. Now, as humans, we understand that these two examples here describe the same type or category of accident, but a computer wouldn't innately connect these two. And this is why we need to extract this information from the text in a format that's both easily understandable and searchable by computers. In other words, during text analysis, we turn unstructured data into structured data for further analysis. And this is what makes Polyanal such a valuable tool. It uses powerful linguistic algorithms that make it easier for us to convert unstructured data while also providing high accuracy results. So let's start with an overview of Polyanalyst. This figure here represents the basic components involved in the Polyanalyst system architecture. In a typical environment, we have our data sources represented in this left panel which are hosted locally or through a database management system. And Polyanalyst can interact with and access these data sources through the Polyanalyst server, which is represented by the center panel of the figure here. Now, Polyanalyst is a client-server system. All calculations and tasks are performed in the Polyanalyst server environment on a Windows machine. And Polyanalyst clients, represented by this panel on the right, are able to connect to this Polyanalyst server using a TCP IP or SSL protocol to pass requests and tasks to this machine in order to perform and return results. So this architecture allows one machine with ample resources to run all these processes, as well as allowing remote access and flexibility for users. Now in newer versions of the software, all Polyanalyst clients are browser-based which means that the clients or the interface that users interact with can be used in any operating system. The Polyanalyst web reports, as represented by this gray box on the lower right, are also browser-based in newer versions of the software, so they can be accessed and edited in any operating system. Now, if you prefer working with APIs, we now have an API to work with Polyanalyst as well. You can find more information about the API on our GitHub page. In order to conduct any work, we need to use a client to connect to the server that's been started on the designated Windows machine. So let's go over how we start Polyanalyst Server and connect to it with the client. On a Windows Server machine, we need to run the Start Polyanalyst Server as a service application. Once it's been successfully started, it'll give us the message you see on this slide. Then, on a user machine connected via network to the Windows Server machine, run the Polyanalyst Analytical Client, specify the connection, and provide our credentials. Finally, once the Polyanalyst Client connects to the server, it'll open this welcome menu. And from here, we can use the options on the menu to view the user manual, create a new project, or open an existing project. Let's now take a look at the different components of the Polyanalyst interface. Here's an example of what you'll see when you open an existing project. At the top part of the client window, we have the menu bar. 
Right below the menu bar, we have the toolbar, which allows us quick access to the most common features we use in Polyanalyst. On the left side, we have the node panel, where you'll find all the different tools that you can use to analyze your data, grouped under categories. We call these tools nodes in Polyanalyst. And this is a term we use for actions or activities when we refer to a workflow, which is essentially what we're building in a project to analyze our data. And this is where we build the workflow, in our flowchart. The flowchart turns into the results pane when we open a node to review the results of the task that's performed. On the bottom left, you can see the window selector, which is very useful when we want to switch between node windows that we've opened or when we want to close them so that we can navigate our projects more easily. And finally, we have the task list at the bottom where we can see the status of a task, such as saving a project or executing a node. This is also where we see any error messages associated with the nodes that have failed to execute. Now, let's go over how to build a workflow like you see in the center panel here. We will start with an existing project where we have already loaded our data, and we would like next add a Modify Columns node. I can scroll through the nodes in my node panel to find it under the relevant category, or I can simply search for the node I am interested in in the search field of the node panel. Once I start typing, Polyanalyst will suggest the nodes I may be looking for. Then all I have to do is drag and drop the node in my workflow. Another way I can add a node is by right-clicking anywhere on my workflow, selecting Add from the pop-up menu, and adding my node from the relevant category. Similarly, if I wish to delete a node, I can right-click on the node and select Delete. The same menu allows us to copy and paste a node. Now that we have our nodes, let's go over how we connect them. Now nodes interact with directed connections. So if we have these two nodes on our workflow, for example, we simply hover over the executed nodes icon until we see this little red arrow. Then we click that arrow and drag it over to the node we want to connect. Then you'll see that the nodes are connected. And if everything is configured properly, we can double click on the node or right click and select execute. Now, if you want a little more control over how many nodes are executed at that time, you can instead choose the Execute to Here option from the pop-up menu. And once that second node has been executed successfully, it'll look like this. Let's go over a few of the icon states you might see. The first one we just saw is the green check mark. This means that the node has been successfully executed. The second one is a yellow circle with an exclamation point. This means that the node is on standby, so it's been configured, but it hasn't been executed yet. The third one is a big X on the node. This means that our node has failed to execute. In this case, we'll also see a message in the taskbar telling us what caused the failure. And when we see a small red circle with an X, it means that the node is either unconnected or unconfigured. Finally, we might see a node that has a triangle with an exclamation point at the top of the node. This means that there was a slight error in the execution, but not the type of error to cause a failure. And in this case, you won't get an error in the taskbar. So in order to check what the error is, we need to go view the log. So if you right click on the node with an error like this, you can select the view log option. And this will pop up a screen that shows the error message. So this is what the workflow of a typical project looks like. As you can imagine, it may get complicated and difficult to navigate if we have many different tasks and types of analysis to perform, especially for people seeing the project for the first time and trying to figure out what's going on. And this is why we have the node grouping feature. You can think of a group node like a subfolder that contains uh, parts of the workflow that we don't want in the main interface. Now as good practice, 
it's highly recommended to use these group notes to organize the different parts of your analysis so that you have a clean and nicely structured workflow that's easy to follow. On top of that, it's a good idea to rename your group notes and your individual notes with something that describes their content or purpose. For example, in this project, we see that the workflow branches for the taxonomy and the data-driven analysis are nicely organized under these group notes with descriptive names. Now, let's see how we do this in Polyanalyst. Creating group notes is very simple. We start by highlighting the nodes that we want grouped, and we need to have at least one node in order to create this group node. Next, you can right-click on the highlighted nodes and select Group from the pop-up menu. Now, if we want to ungroup the nodes, it's more or less the same steps. We right-click and select Ungroup from the pop-up menu, or click the Ungroup button in the toolbar. Now, when we open a group node, we'll see a structure like this. And it's important to note this node grouping can only have one incoming connection point and one outgoing connection point, regardless of how many workflow branches we have in our group node. And sometimes we might be missing an incoming or outgoing connection point, depending on how we formed our group node. As you can see here, we have an incoming connection point, but we don't have an outgoing connection point. Let's say we finished with our data cleansing task and now we want to connect this grouped part of the workflow to our main workflow to continue our analysis. All we need to do is right click anywhere inside the group node and we'll see that we have two options for our connection points. The top one, which says can have incoming links, has a check mark because we already have an incoming connection point. The bottom one, which says can have outgoing links, is the one we want to select in this case. Once we select this option, we see that an outgoing connection point has appeared inside our group node. Now our group node has an outgoing link that we can use to connect another node or a branch so that we can continue with our analysis. Now that we've covered some information about the graphical user interface of Polyanalyst, we'll talk about the order in which our nodes are executed and how Polyanalyst gives us full control over execution waves. The execution wave order is always from left to right. So if we have a single branch in our workflow, the execution wave will start from the leftmost node and continue to the right like this. But what happens if our workflow has more than one branch, like in this picture? In this case, the execution of the nodes will happen from left to right on each branch of the workflow at the same time, like this. In many cases, our workflow includes computationally intensive nodes that we'd like to avoid re-executing. For example, let's say that we decide to make some modifications in this middle node here, but the last node in our workflow is computationally intensive. In that case, we'd want to make sure that we're satisfied with our modifications before re-executing any of the downstream nodes, especially the last one. And Polyanalyst gives us full control over our execution wave with two different execution options execute and execute to here. The default execute option executes any unexecuted node. So for example, if I select execute for the third node, it'll execute that node and also continue executing down the workflow like this. In contrast, the execute to here option will only execute any nodes up to and including the selected one. So if we choose the execute to here option from this third node, it will only execute that node and it will not execute any of the nodes following it. The last thing we'll talk about in this overview is the internal knowledge base or warehouse that is used behind the scenes in Polyanalyst. We call these knowledge resources or dictionaries and they play an integral role in the function of many nodes, especially the ones focusing on text analysis tasks. Polyanalyst dictionaries are structured lists of words or phrases. Some of them define word relationships in their hierarchical organization, for example, synonyms, hypernyms, or hyponyms, but they can also include information about other properties of words, for example, if they're nouns or adjectives, or for a name whether it has a higher probability to be male or female. In other words, dictionaries add contextual and semantic information that's important for accurate natural language processing. Now, Polyanalyst comes with these dictionaries already installed, 
However, if we need to create a domain specific or project specific dictionary, we have the ability to create a custom dictionary as well. Additionally, these dictionaries can be stored on the server so that we can use them across different projects, or they can be saved only on a specific project if we choose. And as you can see, Polyanalyst has many different types of dictionaries that are used in different nodes and tasks. And we'll talk in more detail about some of these dictionaries when we get into the nodes that use these. For now, we'll take a closer look at this knowledge warehouse of Polyanalyst by using the Dictionary Manager. The Dictionary Manager allows us to check information about the different dictionaries, add new dictionaries, and edit existing ones. As you can see on the left, we have a list of the dictionary categories or types, and they're separated into server and project dictionaries. Of course, the pre-installed dictionaries that come with Polynest will be on the server. And when we click on one of these categories, it gives us a list of dictionaries it contains. We can also see when they were last modified and who the creator is. And once you select a specific dictionary, you can get further details. Here we've selected the human names dictionary that contains several sub-dictionaries. And at the bottom of the manager in this dictionary description panel here, we can see the information these contain and which nodes use them. And finally on the top, we can see the toolbar of the dictionary manager. On there, we have a language option. This is because different languages have different dictionaries. So when we look for dictionaries or create new dictionaries, we need to make sure to have the right language selected. By default, it's set to English. And once we're finished with the Dictionary Manager, we can exit this view by right-clicking on the window in the Windows selector. Thanks for watching this introduction to Polyanalyst. Up next, we'll be going over a typical text analysis workflow.